Hello. Well, today I want to talk about a very important case for directors. And in particular, it's a case that directors of juristic persons, of companies, would consider when they're thinking about disqualification. And that's, of course, disqualification pursuant to the Company Directors Disqualification Act 1986. The case that we're going to look at is instructive because it gives us some examples of conduct which were found to be unfit pursuant to section 6 of the CDDA 86. But it's also instructive, is the case, because it gives us guidance on the periods of disqualification. So what kind of conduct can lead to what kind of period of disqualification? And the case, of course, is perhaps the most famous in the realm of director's disqualification. And it's, of course, Re Seven Oaks Stationers, brackets, Retail Coast, brackets, Limited, 1990 square brackets, BCLCs at page 568, or on appeal, 1991 square brackets, BCLCs at 325. If you want to look at it in the officials, it's 1991 square brackets, Chancery 164. The facts are interesting. So in terms of the director's conduct, what he did and what was uh, alleged by the official receiver to be unfit conduct included failing to keep proper accounting records for one of his companies in a group, failing in respect of two companies to ensure that annual returns were filed with the Registrar of Companies, failing in respect of all five companies to ensure that audited accounts were prepared and delivered to the Registrar of Companies, causing loan, debt guarantee and debt payment transactions to be made between companies when the Director knew or ought to have known that there were severe financial difficulties, causing certain of the companies to continue to trade whilst insolvent, and then finally, failing to pay crown debts in respect of PAYE and national insurance contributions and VAT. So they were all instances of conduct, so as you can see, other than the tax issues, conduct which is, in essence, breaches of Companies Act provisions designed to be the quid pro quo of the extension of the privilege of limited liability. So we give you limited liability as a legislature, and in exchange for that, you must account publicly for various issues of your company's activity, such as your accounts or, or other elements of, of how your company runs on a day-to-day -day uh, uh, day -day, uh, 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 sense. So, Mr. Justice Harmon, at first instance, found that those activities were unfit pursuant to the Act and that the director should be disqualified for a period of seven years from being a director of a company or in any way being concerned or taking part in the promotion, formation or management of a company without the leave of the court. The director was, of course, unhappy so he appeals up to the Court of Appeal, which is Dillon, Butler, Sloss and Stoughton, Lord Justices, at uh, this stage, uh, and they hear the appeal. Uh, and of course, for us, it's interesting because of a term or phrase that those judges use in the Court of Appeal uh, in terms of the conduct. Uh, and they say this, that the matters alleged and proved show the director to have been guilty of incompetence or negligent in a very marked degree and that therefore the disqualification order had been rightly made uh, but they reduced the period of disqualification to five years which is interesting. I'll come on to the periods in a moment but first I'll just address that phrase that they used in terms of negligence and a marked degree of conduct, 
or a, a, a form of conduct that uh, was negligent to a marked degree, I should say. That's interesting. We know that in what is now section 174 of the Companies Act 2006, we have our negligence-based duties, which in themselves are taken from section 214 of the Insolvency Act 86. And it's that, that part objective and part subjective tests that sit in 214 or 174 are those that regulate our director's negligence-based duties. And that we know if there is a breach, that director is accountable to the company. But what we seem to see here in the Court of Appeal, perhaps, is that the conduct of the director needs to be something more than just mere negligence in their activities in relation to that juristic person. They must do something more, perhaps, to be deemed to be unfit. And here in Seven Oaks Stationers, we've seen that that conduct was, of course, failure to pay tax obligations, failure to keep accounts, uh, and such like. So, to the periods of disqualification. Seven Oaks Station is, is, is often used as authority for the various periods that Dillon, Lord Justice Dillon, outlines in the case. And he says this, that I would, for my part, endorse the division of the potential 15-year disqualification period into three brackets. One, the top bracket of disqualification for periods over 10 years should be reserved for particularly serious cases. These may include cases where a director who has already had one period of disqualification imposed on him falls to be disqualified yet again. So that's our first bracket. The second is this, the minimum bracket of two to five years disqualification should be applied where, though disqualification is mandatory, the case is relatively not very serious. And then finally he says the middle bracket of disqualification from six to ten years should apply for serious cases which do not merit the top bracket. So the difference between the bottom two to five and then five to ten is something that we could argue is ambiguous that which Lord Justice Dillon has given us. Particularly because in this case, Re Seven Oaks, we see that one judge, Mr Justice Harmon, thinks that seven years is appropriate on the facts for what has occurred, but that Lord Justice Dillon and his brethren in the Court of Appeal thinks that it should be five years, something that's at the top of what he would call the lower end. So think about Re Seven Oaks Stationers in the time sense of disqualification, but also think of it in its fact sense to have an idea of what kind of behaviour can lead to a five-year disqualification order in this instance. Secondary sources are incredibly important. You have a number of learned commentators who have looked at these areas. Of course, you've Dr Williams, Richard Williams at Cambridge, whose PhD work and subsequent scholarship has thought about these areas of disqualification. And his book, which is published by Jordans, is very readable and interesting. Of course, you also have Malcolm Davis White, QC, and Professor Walter's book. I would say monograph, but it's, uh, well, comprehensive. So it's a very good secondary source to have a look at, in addition to Dr. Williams' book. And then, of course... You have his honour judge, Abbas Mithani QC, as the general editor of his work, Mithani on Director's Disqualification. And we now know that that four volume, I think it is, loose leaf, is incredibly authoritative on our subject. Perhaps look at the work of Williams in the secondary source sense, particularly articles, and of course, uh, Walters and Davis White and their, their excellent scholarship as well on the subject. Okay, so next we will look at other areas that touch on how directors interact with the insolvency laws, but until then, goodbye.